Uh, stand with me if you would. Uh, turn your Bibles uh, to uh, John 19, uh, John chapter 19, and verse 28. I did start a message around the um, this the Passion Week of Christ, uh, and it was the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. In John 19, we see. Uh, I'm just going to do. I'm not going to review uh, for time's sake, but. Um, uh, he, he did say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, the first thing. Second thing was, you, uh, you will be with me in paradise, as he turned to uh, the, um, uh, the thief on the cross that repented on the cross and believed. And then the woman, uh, behold your son, he took care of his mama. And, um, and then uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me in Matthew twenty-seven forty-six that uh, we understood what he went through and was going through at that very moment. But here, in the last three statements, I'll be brief tonight, but because uh, I do want to spend some time in prayer, but uh, very, very important in John uh, 19, the other, one of the, the, the fifth thing that he said in, in verse 28, we see that he is, um, of course, in the process of crucifixion or has been crucified, and we see in verse 25, now there stood by the cross of John 19, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and it, it, by, by the way, I mean, I mean, isn't it amazing how here's, this is the Mary Magdalene that uh, spent a year's wages on the, in the alabaster box of sweet perfume or spikenard, as the Bible calls it, and, uh, and bathed Christ and anointed him for his, barrel, for his burial. She had more on the ball than the disciples did, amen? And uh, that she, had, she understood it. I could see, um, here she is staring up at him, being crucified. And, and listen, let me, let me tell you something. She wasn't, re she wasn't regretting going, you know, that was a waste of money. You know, I think when we get to heaven and we look back on the monies given towards missions and monies given toward the church or, or the, uh, to see people saved and, and encouraged and blessed. I don't think we're going to be like, man, that was a waste of money. Amen. So we see uh, verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his, his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, okay, so obviously he's got the mind, he's still the son of God, he has the, he, he's omniscient, right, he knows all that's going on in his mind, it's sort of meta thought going on, right, but then he's also the man experiencing the crucifixion in time and in space, and uh, so here, he understands what's going on in, the, uh, in the, 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 the metaphysical reality of what's going on, but then he understands what's going on, certainly in the physical. And he says um, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, put it upon hyssop, and put it unto his mouth. And Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Father, I pray you'd bless these few moments of teaching and the scriptures. And God, I pray that we would uh, not just pass by because it's Easter week or uh, b uh, last week or p the Passion Week, uh, the week that celebrates on the Christian calendar the events that took place uh, the last week you had on earth physically. That after that, it's okay, we're on to something different. But, Lord, we can teach and preach and meditate on the cross between now and the time that we see you, and it would not be exhausted. And so, Father, I pray that you'd bless our teaching now tonight. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll be seated. Thank you. So here, the thing that Jesus said, and it's interesting, he says that the scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. So what scripture is that that is being fulfilled when, when he says, I thirst? So we see in, uh, in, in, is in Psalm 69. Uh, look what it says there. And uh, flip, keep your finger here and then flip back to Psalm 69. And you'll see 
<coughs> Psalm 69, we should look at verse 21. In the Psalms, it's amazing, you know, that David went through all that he went through. He was hunted down uh, by Saul. And uh, in the time he spent sort of being a victim, if you would, running around and, and uh, hiding in caves and, and being unjustly treated and not having any recourse to go to. He couldn't appeal to a court of law, right? He couldn't uh, call 911 and say, you know, this guy's chasing me and appeal to a, a law enforcement agency over Saul. To keep. He had no one because he was the king. And, uh, so, but he appealed to Christ. He, or he, he appealed to God. In that experience, and in those experiences, the emotional frustration and darkness and pain and suffering that he wrote about in the Psalms while he was being chased, while he was in the cave of Adullam and, and uh, training up these, the mighty men that came to him and all of that, that he somehow divinely ordained as he wrote about his emotions some of those emotions were the very words that Christ would speak prophetically. So it's amazing that David's suffering was the vehicle through which God used to write the very words that the words that Christ would say on the cross. And here in Psalm 69, um, and I, you know, I just it just makes me think at a practical level that the you know the sufferings that we go through in our lives in our time that God is using that to be a help and blessing to other people. I just say that. I hope some of you older saints know that. You understand that because you've seen it. You were able to dip into the well, if you would, of your own dark, dark nights and pain and suffering and pull out of that and give a, give a nice cool water to drink to some people when you're sitting down talking to them. And you know what? And you're like, I know. And they're like, I don't know. I'm going through this. You're like, It'll be all right. You can go. You'll go. You'll be on the other side of that. I've been through that. You know. Here's, Amen. Psalm uh, Psalm sixty nine, and uh, verse twenty one. Well, let, let's back up because we see it's amazing how we see here is David crying out. He says, "Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee." Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Ever been there? No comforters? No one to take pity? Look at verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, et cetera, et cetera. So here, Jesus, even in his own mind, he understands, I'm going to say I thirst, and that's going to motivate them to offer me gall to drink and offer me vinegar to drink. So, so what is the significance, if you would, about I thirst? Well, obviously, it proves and demonstrates that he was a man. He was physically a man. And he, and he was enduring all the physical pain of the crucifixion like anybody else would. So he, when he cried out, I thirst, and, and uh, I, again, if you recall uh, uh, to, uh, the, the Palm Sunday message, when I went through the, the uh, uh, medical uh, condition of uh, experiencing the crucifixion, and we see with all the blood loss that he would be very thirsty. And carrying and sweating in that sun, and and uh, he would be very thirsty. Obviously, it's there's just it's just a, on a base level. It's just the reality of of uh, of him enduring the physical reality of the crucifixion. On a base level, that's what I thirst means. But let me also say that, uh, as I'm already alluding to it, that he understood, and this is this is now stay with me, that he understood that he was part of a. Um, uh, he, he, that he was part of a, of a majestic plan, the plan of God. That his part to play. Remember back when he was 12 years old and, and uh, they, they went to go visit Jerusalem and then they left and, 
and, uh, and, and Mary and Joseph were checking out, checking out the kiddos, and they're just like, hey, where, where, uh, uh, where's Jesus? And they're looking around amongst the stuff, and they don't find them, and they finally go back, and it's now, they were a day and a half out, so now it's a day and a half back, so it's there's three days he's been without. And here they found Jesus just in the temple it, it discussing and quoting and or not arguing per se, uh, but, but debating and, and discussing theological reality with the, with the teachers of the law. And, um, and uh, remember, she, she rebuked him, and, and, uh, and he said, uh, uh, mine hour is not yet good. Would ye, would ye not know that I would be about my father's business? And I believe at age 12, at that moment, he fully understood that he was the Messiah. That's just what I believe. That he understood it. It was, be, you know, again, he, there was a limitation to his awareness uh, from birth until then. But I think at that moment, fully aware, fully understood, I am the Messiah. And um, he, uh, because that day forward, everything changed. And he said, I must be about my father's business. And, and he knows that he was about, that his part in his father's business had to, that, that he understood. And he understood this for a long time. It was no, he wasn't caught by surprise that he had to endure the crucifixion. But he understood that and he accepted that. And part of that was that physical pain. So when he, cried, when he says, I thirst, if you look at the text uh, back there again in John 19, and uh, when he says uh, that all the scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. That, that this is, I am a part of a, you, you might say, you know, we use the phrase, you're just a pawn in the game. Right? There's an old Bob Dylan song, just a pawn in the game. Amen, Harry? And that was all for, that was just for Harry. I mean, you know. But Brother Mike, you know, you might. You might. <laughs> Just a pawn in the game, right? And uh, but we might use that term. That's sort of a colloquial way of saying I'm a pawn in the game, right? And uh, but but Jesus understood that he was a part of a master plan of the whole universe. Now, what am I saying all that for? On practical application for you and me, you know, sometimes we just have to accept what our role is. You know, I remember being in uh, in uh, at Drew University, brother Daryl. And I remember going to, I, I was all over the place, right? I'm, you know, I'm going to Bible studies with Jehovah Witnesses. You know, I'm taking philosophy in college, and I'm all over the place. Anthropology, sociology, psychology, I'm, I'm all over the place, right? Going to this, uh, uh, she was a female pastor, Protestant Bible study. I'm, I'm, I'm having lunch with our, uh, our resident uh uh, Father uh, Joe Darius, who was our the, the Catholic priest who was on campus, because I was Roman Catholic at the time, and and uh, you know I was there, and, and it was a it was a Methodist school, so there was a divinity school, so I, I'd have lunch over here with all these you know they're going to be pastors, you know these Methodist pastors, and I'm just like you know 18, 19 year old punk who just wanted to talk theology, like I knew what I was talking about. I don't know what I was talking about. I still don't. Someone say amen right there. <clears throat> and uh, but through all of that, I had a friend of mine come up and say this. He's like, listen, man. He's like, and I it, and I really it kind of was like uh, it was a shock to me when he said it. He goes, you know what you need to do? He goes, you you need to just accept this. He goes, you're just kind of you're just kind of and he was not a Christian at the time. He was not a Christian, but he was he was a classics. Actually, he was studying philosophy and the classics and all that. He said, you, you just need, because basically he was like saying, he was saying that your whole life is pointing toward belief in God, but you haven't gotten there yet and you're not, you're not submitting to it yet. He said, you need to just look in the mirror and decide that that's what you're going to do. And I'm like, that was pretty cool advice, amen? He was right on. He was spot on. And, and, and sometimes we just need to look in the mirror and say, that's my role. I can't look back and go, man, I wish my life was this way. I wish I hadn't have done that. And, and this happened and that happened and that happened. And oh, man, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we can do that until Jesus comes back. But we just got to accept where we're at and say, you know what? This is what, the, okay, 
I accept that there's a providential God, okay? I'm just going to move forward and do what God wants me to do. I, here I am in this, in this world, in my environment, in my community here, and I'm just going to bloom or I'm planted, amen? I'm just going to say it's God's will from here on out and let's go. Amen? amen. That the scriptures might be fulfilled in our lives. Now, secondly, um, he said it is finished, right in the same text here, right in the same. And, and this really is the summation of what I just said. It follows along and completes what, I, what right what I was saying. When he said, when I was 12, uh, uh, woman, what have I to do with thee? I'm, would ye not know that I would be about my father's business? He's saying it is finished. He finished. He said, I've come uh, to do the will of my father and to finish it, he said. His face was set like a flint to obey the father. Amen? He, he was going in obedience to his father. And I know, you know, we have all these, you know, these, these, these cushy, you know, Christian love songs. Amen? Some of these cushy love songs, they're like, it's like these emotional... Like you can just tweak the the words and it's like lovers singing to each other, amen. But and, and there's part of that. I know Song of Solomon's in the Bible, amen. But um, but you know we, we and, and but part of that is like oh he did all he did this all for me he did this all for me. But let me just say first time out hey he first did it to to, to obey his father. Am I just changing your theology when I say that? Now we know that he did it for our redemption. So we don't have to go to hell, we can go to heaven. Amen? I believe that. But he did it, I believe, first and foremost in obedience to his father. Out of love for the father. Because you read, you read over there in Isaiah 53, and it's the father, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. See, we're, I, I just think we're all secondary. I think this love between the son and the father was an eternity past. And this is all just playing out in history, in time, after the creation of the world. Remember, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. So put that on your metaphysical hat on there, amen? But you understand that the son... In love, obeyed the Father, and he was finishing, what was he finishing? Yes, he was finishing redemption. He was finishing the, the payment for sin. All that's true, all that's true, but he was finishing his Father's business. I must be about my Father's business. I'm here to fulfill the will of God for my life, basically, is what he's saying. You know, you know, and, and I, I remember uh, being in missions conferences, and and when uh, and knew some missionaries that went to mission schools and all that, and they and I remember and uh, when I was there that I was I, I got a chance to sit in on some of the some of the training that was taking place, and they said this. They said if you go to the mission field out of love for those people, you're going to come back eventually because your heart's going to be broke because they're not going to love you back. Say, what? Well, I'm going to, to help uh, the people of Israel. Uh, I'm going to help the people of Bulgaria. I love them, and they, have my, they are born in my heart. Remember old uh, 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 Jonathan Livingston, you know, that he, he was there in Africa, and, he, and, and they buried, and they had one claim, but we're going to take his heart. They cut his heart out and buried it there, and this was where his heart was. He loved us, the people, and all that's true. But we... But you know what they? But you know what they, what they said? And this is this is not me. It's a veteran missionary to younger missionaries in training. You go out of love for Jesus. You go because God called you to do it. So when they when they're up when they're up and they're down and, and they bring you treats or they stab you in the back, it doesn't matter because you're there because God called you there. And that's the same for you and I. We don't serve other people. Now, we do serve other people because we love them, because we have compassion, and all that's true. I'm just talking priorities here. But we have to do it out of love for God first. We are to finish the will of God because why are you doing this? Because you love them? Well, well, sure, but I'm doing it first of all because God called me to do it. 
if you do it out of if you do it in obedience to God, no matter how they respond, you're all right. Oh, you know what? I did all this and I, I gave them money and I cut their lawn and I, you know, I took them to the doctor. They never said thank you. I can't believe that. Good night. Why should I do that again? Or did God call you to do that? Yeah. Done. Check the box. Move on. We don't wait around for other people's approval, other people's pats on the back. Amen? And listen, I'm just like you, okay? I'm looking for that pat in the back too, okay? I mean, on a human level, okay? I'm not saying I'm the austere man of God up here, okay? I'm just being realistic. But, but we are to do it unto Christ, unto God. We are to finish his work because he called us to do that. Am I, am I like preaching heresy up here? Uh, turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. And I've said, mentioned this a number of times. But, you know, he one of the things, too, his suffering. Uh, I, I really don't have time to dig into this concept that, you know, where it says in Hebrews that he learned suffering. You know, basically that the experience that he went through to become our high priest. That's a, I'll just have to preach that another day. But uh, here in Hebrews chapter 2, I have mentioned, uh, I do mention this a number of times, but <coughs> Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 14. It says, for his two, Hebrews 2, 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part flesh and blood. Okay? Part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, remember, if you link that with uh, Revelation 3.15, or Genesis, rather. Genesis 3.15. Keep your finger there. Look at Genesis 3.15. Remember, the, uh, here it is at the initial fall of man, Adam and Eve, sin, and uh, the serpent. And stand before God, and God is now about to, to uh, uh, bring out retribution and judgment on their sin. Each three of them were involved in the sin. And uh, so he says the, uh, to the man, um, you know, uh, um, who, you know why'd you, why would you hide? Why would you do this? Oh, the woman that you gave us me, it's your fault. You gave me this woman here. Amen. And the woman well, woman, what did you do? Well, no, it was the serpent. He beguiled me. It wasn't my fault. He was really good at beguiling. And then he goes to the serpent, and this is the judgment he lays on the serpent. Number one, that, that now you're not going to walk around on, you know, to be bipedal. Is that what that is? Two, two feet walking around? Uh, but you're going to slither on your, bat, on your belly as a, as a mark of the curse on, uh, on all serpents. Uh, and it was this. It was the the animal that Satan in, in, uh, uh, possessed to be able to beguile the, the, the woman. And then he said, "This I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Okay, between you and the woman, right? Between Satan and the woman, between your seed, the seed of Satan. Now, that's a whole other subject. Amen. What is that?" I think we're seeing a few sprouts going on in our culture today. Someone say amen right there. We're seeing a few oak trees that are a couple stories high going on here. From the seed of Satan being planted. And, uh, but notice it says, um, thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So it shall bruise thy head. So the seed of uh, of, of, the, uh, of the woman will bruise, because he's addressing the serpent, the seed of woman who is the Christ, and the woman is Mary the virgin, right? A virgin, behold, a virgin shall conceive, right? And uh, the, um, and it was written in the stars, amen? Virgo, the first co constellation, a Virgo, a virgin holding a child, you know? God wrote it in the stars, amen? And uh, so between thy seed and her seed, 
It shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. So, so he's going to bruise your head. The seed of woman, born of Mary, is going is to destroy the authority and power of Satan, his head. The head, you know, the power, the authority. And uh, you're going to bruise his heel. So that means, but you're still going to grab him by the heel. Remember like uh, when uh, Jacob and Esau were born, right? And old Esau was a supplanter, and he was grabbing. Esau was born first, but old Jacob had that hand on that heel, right? I'm going to grab at that. And uh, certainly uh, that, that means that although for Christ to be able to, the seed of woman, to be able to thwart or destroy or conquer the head, that's the power and the authority of Satan, he would have to die. And when Jesus cried, it is finished, that was finished. It was the father's business, but it was, it was, um, it was uh, obviously it was the price of redemption being paid, and and the atonement, and uh, and uh, the propitiation for our sins, and and all of that uh, was finished at that moment. But this was was this was also that he destroyed and finished the business of the Messiah. The the, the chosen one, the Christ, the seed of woman. And then lastly, real simple, and I'm done. He just, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So notice that this, this, he proves that he's still God. That even though he was obeying the father, and, and you know, you read in Isaiah 53 where it says, you know, the father, uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Like it, was, it seemed that he was just a pawn in the game. But we all. But at the very end, Jesus asserts his own uh, autonomy. Let me use that fancy word. He asserts the fact that he's in charge of what's going on, that he was not an unwilling participant. He was not this lamb that was like these all the lambs that were taken on that very day that this happened. And they were, maybe they were kicking and screaming and, you know, pulling back. They knew what they were going. And they're dragging him and they're slitting him and throwing him on the altar unwillingly. But Jesus, of his own volition, went to the cross. And even commanded his own spirit to say, okay, I'm going to die now. Out of his, own, uh, of his own power, of his own decision, of his own will. As an act of his own autonomy. An authority. He commends my, he, he, okay, now I'm giving my spirit back to the Father. Amen? And uh, so we praise the Lord for that. And we are to use our freedom and our autonomy for our, to fulfill the will of God for our life. Amen? Amen.